So this morning we're continuing our series called Small Story, Big Story, in which we take a fresh look at some of the similar stories in our scripture library to find how these small stories might point us to the big story of God's love for us and for all people, and maybe in the process even find that the heart of our story has a part to play in that big story as well. And it's been great because sometimes these small stories are like microcosms of the whole story, little glimpses that explain a lot, that explain everything. And we have those in our own lives and relationships as well. Like for my wife, Lindsay, and me, uh, we have some stories that seem like they explain a lot about our relationship and about who we are. Like on our first kind of date, uh, when Lindsay and I went out to eat together, when the check came, I realized that I forgot my wallet. <laughs> And so Lindsay paid for my meal on our very first date together. Yep, that actually happened in our life. But never fear, I was like, um, I was ahead of things because paying her back meant that I got to see her again. And that's you, right? I'm always thinking two steps behind and trying to catch up. So remember, all of these of you who are out in the dating world, um, remember and learn from me and do the exact opposite of what I do. So that story explains a lot about our relationship. It's like this little microcosm. But as we've said here before, when we look back at the overarching narrative in our scripture library, the story that appears is one of a God who created humanity in the image of God, of sacred worth, who loves all people, who declares all people are children of God, as our team has led us today to remind us that nothing separates us from that fundamental identity and that love that we have in God. And that through history, God has been at work in humanity and in history to help us see it more and more. Across our borders and boundaries, our divides and distinctions, God has been at work through culture and context. And we see that work of God among us, pulling us toward that vision of all. That open vision, like this giant attractive force that pulls us along through history toward the open heart of God to open our eyes and our hearts to an ever-widening understanding of the breath of God's love. And that's the story that you find, a vision of love that expanded from one person to one family to one tribe to one nation to other nations and ethnicities and races and genders, Jew and Gentile and Greek, the story goes on. Every time humanity's doors were closed, God was at work opening them until we meet Jesus who brought it all together whose message was simple and wide, whose invitation was anyone, everyone, whosoever, all who would come, come and find life and find that the love of God is for you. And if you forgot your wallet, you are welcome too, Jesus says. I'm pretty sure that's in the Bible there too. It makes me feel better about myself. So if you look at the stories of Scripture and they ever seem exclusive or regressive, it's because oftentimes we're looking at snapshots of a story arc midway. And in our time, we know that this story arc is not finished, that we have work to do. We have not reached yet the fullness of the vision of the beloved community of the kingdom, the kingdom of God and the new creation in which we are all welcomed and full together. And those places where we are not there yet, the call in our lives is that those are our stories to write with each other and with the God who's at work pulling us all toward the place where every child of God, no matter age, race, gender, identity, orientation, faith, background, whether you are native-born or immigrant, no matter your doubts or your questions, whether you listen to country or Kanye or Beyonce, whatever your background is, that you are loved by God, where all are welcomed and affirmed in the family of God for who they are. That is our story to write in our generation, and it is the story that God has always been writing on humanity. We see it in the big narrative arc in our scripture library. When you put the pieces together and you trace that arc of history, but today I want to tell you one story that's like a microcosm of the whole thing, where we can see the arc, where we can see that pull of God's love for all people, and we can see it maybe with a little clarity. Now, just to warn you, whenever we talk about the sweeping arc of history, um, saying it that way, the sweeping arc, makes it seem simple and clean. And so, some, sometimes we picture you know, the arc of history like the smooth trajectory, like a Norwegian ski jumper, just flying gracefully through the air. But the reality of history, as we know, is a little bit more like me skiing <laughs> along the way, right? It's bumps and bruises and crashes, and oftentimes our, head are above our, our feet are above our head, and not because we're doing a trick, but because we've been tricked by gravity along the way. 
But there is this force, even still, even still, that is pulling us along. The heart of God, perhaps. In my case, skiing, it is the force of gravity that is pulling me along. But it is pulling us toward this world in which the sacred worth of all people is included and affirmed and empowered in their unique giftedness. And the witness of our story is that over and over that God is able to draw us and move us there. So this story at times is going to seem bumpy, (laughs) but hold on, because the arc of it all, in the arc of it all, we will see a glimpse of God's heart that lands gracefully like a Norwegian ski jumper among us and calls us to be a part of that story as well. So the story today is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that begins Uh, that we find in in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, this book about how the vision of Jesus took shape among the first followers. And the Ethiopian eunuch that we will meet was the first non-Jewish follower of the way after Jesus. But to understand why this story, why their story is so powerful and important, we have to go back a little bit for context, about a thousand years. And I know that's how like all of my sermons go, but this time it's actually important that we go back in a... We need to understand the whole story to understand the power of this story. And so let's start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start, right? So the term eunuch um, may not be a term that you're familiar with because it's an ancient term and ancient practice. And this is a mixed age room, and so I'm going to be a little euphemistic about eunuchs, not because of shame, but just to try to be uh, conscientious. But within the ancient cultures of the ancient Near East, the region and time that Scripture takes place in, It was a fairly common practice for some people to live as eunuchs, as castrated males. And some were made this way, some were born this way, some some chose it, some came upon it by other means. But this was a fairly common reality in the ancient Near Eastern cultures, in places like Egypt and and Canaan and Persia and Babylon. And in those cultures, eunuchs were able to move between gender spaces. They served in the courts and the temples as stewards, Uh, They took care of the the queen or the king's wives or harems, as we saw in the story of Esther a few weeks ago. In the understanding of their day, eunuchs were considered, oftentimes in the culture, a third gender category. And they occupied, really, a non-binary place in the gender spectrum of the day. And because they occupied that non-binary identity, eunuchs could move fluidly to advise kings in masculine spaces and to serve queens in the feminine spaces of the ancient world. But in Israelite Hebrew culture, about 1300 BCE, what we're talking about, eunuchs were not common. And so in 1300 BCE, when the Hebrew people began to form and their community took shape, like every culture, they began to draw their cultural laws and rules, their boundary lines over who's in and who's out. And because they were living in close proximity and amidst many other different nations, many of the laws were concerned with avoiding any hint of foreign religious practices or foreign people groups. This was where their attention was in the day. And for the Hebrews, uh, eunuchs were associated with foreign cultures, with Egypt and Canaan and Persia and Babylon, and with the practices of worship of other gods. And so when they're writing their laws about who is allowed in the religious assembly into the family of God, so to speak, they wrote this clear word. No one who is a eunuch shall be admitted into the assembly of the Lord, period. And then two verses later, they just excluded all foreigners. They said, no Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. And you read this, and the the clarity of this particular verse, this is one of those ski bumps of exclusion along our way. The law says it, that settles it and the best of what they understood and of how to be reverent in their time. And besides, the Hebrew people thought, we don't have many foreigners or eunuchs in our camp. What does it hurt to exclude them, or so they thought? But remember who I said this story was about and where we're going to get. This is a story about an Ethiopian foreign eunuch. And so you can see where the arc of our story is headed. It's headed toward life, toward real life. And real life oftentimes gets in the way of our easy black and white rules. 
Like when I feel like I am no doubt in the same league as my wife and I deserve my place there and then I show up on a date without my wallet, which that was not the last time that happened to me, I'll just say, belief meet real life, right? I have to come to terms with that. But even for many of us, particularly around our widening, wakening vision of inclusion and equality and what God is up to in our world, it has been life, life experience, relationship experience, our own life awakening to who we are, that life invites us to think in new ways, to wrestle with the old ways. Life invites us, love compels us, and God's heart propels us, pushing us, pulling us onward through culture and time. And often it is life that is the means of change. It is the slope that we are skiing on. But for a time, Israel and their communal life was fine, just like this. And then life happened in a different way. Specifically, the Babylonian exile happened. One of the most formative events in Israel's history. In 587, Israel was conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And the temple, the place of the assembly, was destroyed. And many, many, many people were carried off into exile in Babylon, where they came, became a part of Babylonian and later Persian culture and practice. And in those cultures, as we said, eunuchs were a common part of day-to-day -day life. And many people of Hebrew origin became eunuchs and lived in that identity. And many Hebrews married foreign spouses and raised family within other cultures. And for generations, some Hebrews lived in Babylon and in Persia. Some still remained in Israel or Palestine. But together, over the generations, life happened. At the end of the exile story, the Hebrews who were in exile were given permission by the Persian king to return back to their home from Babylon and to rebuild their culture and community and faith practice as a colony of Persia. And this was a cause as they were given the permission to go back home of great rejoicing and celebration, as you can imagine. Hope and possibility and new life and new imagining of what it could be to go home again were springing up everywhere. They rebuild the temple that they worshiped in, and they're beginning to restart their religious practices. And then they pull out the religious laws of the day, and they come across Deuteronomy 23 that we read about eunuchs and foreigners, that no eunuchs were allowed in the assembly, that no foreigners were allowed, and they, they read this, and then they look around at their circle, at their community, at their siblings and their cousins and their partners, in themselves, at a community that includes foreign families and partners and children, that includes eunuchs that they love and recognize as children of God of sacred worth. But they have this 800-year-old text that says that they are to be kept out, the defining laws of their faith. The law says it, that settles it kind of laws, and they didn't know what to do. But God did. In those moments of tension, in those moments of wrestling with the new ways and the old ways and the reality of life, God was in the midst of that, pulling on them, moving in their midst, working through life and love for the liberation of all people, for the message of good news that is for all people, opening hearts, opening minds, opening doors, opening their arms, just like our God is open. And God was moving and pulling them and us forward through history. And so the prophets in the school of Isaiah were stirred by God, and they brought this word to the assembly that was gathered, to this circle. And I just want to read what it says to you from Isaiah chapter 56. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from God's people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, these I will bring to my holy mountain, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. 
Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those who are already gathered. Isn't that beautiful? To the foreigner and to the eunuch, and even more, God says, do not fear, you have a place here. My house is for all peoples. You are a child of God, and I am gathering you. You belong. And in that moment, I can't imagine what that must have felt like for the community, for those in their midst. In that moment, it must have been beautiful to see a glimpse of the heart of God for all time that is breaking through culture and context and doing something new, the thing that God has always been doing, pulling us forward toward more. But like many glimpses of the open heart of God, the Hebrew community only kind of got it, all right? That's what happens when we get involved. (laughs) For the best of what we know, foreign family members were welcomed in fully, but eunuchs were only partly included in the assembly. They could go into the outer courts to worship, but they were not allowed any further in. They could not serve as priests, and they could not serve as clergy, despite the heart of God that we just read being oh so clear, because the old ways are hard to shake sometimes. Incidentally, this verse from Isaiah 56 is the very verse that Jesus quotes when he goes into the temple and finds people being excluded and exploited. He turns over the tables and quotes Isaiah, my house is to be a house of prayer for all people, and you have turned it in to a den of thieves, he says. There are moments when God pulls hard on us, too, in the midst of this journey. So, there's a little bit of the background context to set up this story. So back to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch comes along about 500 years after Isaiah, a short time after Jesus. Amidst the context of all of this, we encounter the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And it begins like this. There was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The story says that this eunuch had traveled from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship over 2,000 miles by themselves on a chariot (laughs) to go to temple to Jerusalem to worship Isaiah scroll in hand. And, And you wonder, like, why would you travel all that distance? But I think I know why. I think we know why. Imagine this eunuch who perhaps had never felt fully at home in any space. Coming across this passage in Isaiah, reading the passage in Isaiah 56 about a God who loved the eunuch, who embraced them and had a place for them in the family of God that can never be taken away. For the eunuch to read that and to be moved and say, I have to go see myself. I have to go find this God, no matter the distance, no matter the questions, and see for myself this place of full acceptance. And so after 2,000 miles, Isaiah scroll in hand, full of hope and full of heart, they arrived at the house of God to find the humans standing by the door. That the humans who held the door would only let them part way in to the assembly. Only so far, not fully. They were welcomed, but not affirmed. Despite what they'd read, what they'd found in God, and they couldn't understand it, What they experienced did not seem to match up to the heart of God who has a place for them. I can't imagine the hurt. Many of us in this community know that experience too well. You have traveled great distances with great hope to encounter a God who is loved and found the human doors held tight. You're welcome, but only so far. And I want to say to you, as someone in my role who, you know, stands by the doors oftentimes, I am so incredibly and deeply sorry for the times that you've shown up to encounter God and found the doors closed to you. When you felt the call of God on your life and found the doors closed to you because the doors of God's house, of God's family are wide open and there is a place for you and a name for you an everlasting place that can never be cut off no matter what the world or the door holders say. 
because you are a child of God, made unique in the image of God, beautifully and colorfully made of sacred worth. Who you are is loved by God, and who you are is needed in this story. It's needed by all of us. We see that in the Ethiopian eunuch because the story of this eunuch is not over. God's story is not finished. And so let's pick it back up. Remember, the Ethiopian eunuch had been to Jerusalem and is now returning home and is reading the scroll again, perhaps to see what they missed along the way. And along the way, the the eunuch crosses paths with a Jesus follower, with Philip. And that divine spirit, that same spirit that pulls us and nudges us forward, is leading Philip to go to them. So the spirit says to Philip, go to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard them reading the prophet Isaiah. And he asked, do you understand what you're reading? (laughs) Do you understand what you find there? And the eunuch answers, how can I unless someone guides me? And they invited Philip to come in and sit beside The eunuch says, I thought I understood this, but I guess I don't. I thought I would find something different. When I got there, I thought I would find exclusion. Explain this to me. And so Philip does. Philip began to speak, it says in verse 35, starting with this scripture. He shared the good news about Jesus. The story of this vision of the Jesus who got it, who welcomed all and accepted all and affirmed and empowered all, who really showed us the heart of God that is love in full. The Jesus who himself was rejected and excluded, but that in his life, God's love prevailed, that it might prevail for us all. And he shares the rest of this story of the beloved community, of where the ark of God's love is headed, an ark that sometimes because of doors we cannot see, but God is opening them always, because our God's love is true. Our God's love does not separate, and our God's love wins. And one day, We will all see it, even as now we are seen and known and loved. And so as they ride along in the chariot, Philip and the eunuch are talking. The eunuch asks Philip a question. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Baptism was a symbol of, of full acceptance and membership and being a part of the family of God, a symbol that you belong and you have a part and you have a place. And the eunuch asked this question, what prevents me? And I don't think it was a rhetorical question in this moment. I think the eunuch, based on their ski slope experience, their life experience, fully expected Philip to come back with a list, right? Because we've all got that list, and the eunuch had it in spades. Fully expected Philip to come back with a list of things that prevent them from being fully accepted, that Philip would be like, well, let's start with Deuteronomy. Let's go back (laughs) to the Old Testament. But that's not what happens. Here's what the story says. The eunuch commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. And the eunuch went on their way rejoicing. Philip just baptizes them. (laughs) What prevents you? Nothing. You are fully accepted. And the eunuch comes out of the water, and they part ways, and the eunuch goes on their way back to Africa. It does not say that they stopped being a eunuch. It does not say that their body changed. It does not say that their skin color altered. Nothing. They are fully welcomed into the family as they are. And as they ride their chariot back to Ethiopia and continue on their way to live as a eunuch, as an Ethiopian, as a steward in the court of Candace and master of her treasury, the eunuch lived as they are in all they are, but with the knowledge and depth of their spirit that they are loved and accepted fully by God, just as we see in Jesus that they belong in the family of God, and that changes everything. Because they walked away from the temple with sadness, but they walk away from this encounter and this glimpse of God's heart for all people rejoicing. And this, friends, was the first Gentile follower of the way of Jesus after Jesus, an Ethiopian eunuch. 
It was like God was making a big billboard flashing light point for all of us right off the bat. Let's make it very clear who I am and what I am doing, what this new creation work is all about and who my love is for. It is for all people. Even in light of Deuteronomy and exile and Isaiah and Jesus, I am the God whose love is for all people, whose good news is for all people, and it is for you no matter what you belong. Nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And those of us who've experienced that or beginning to experience that, who are being moved and opened by God in our story arcs, we are called to be a people who embody and embrace that and make it so in our generation. To build communities whose open doors embody that love of God in our time, who claim that all people have a place and build a community that make that a reality. And in that work, we don't just need you to know it, but we need you to know it and believe it and live it and trust it. But more than that, we just need you, your story, your journey. Just as the Ethiopian eunuch taught us about God and helped pull us forward, you, all of you, teach us more about the image of God. Who you are is a gift to us. Who you are is a gift because in your sacred uniqueness, you show us all more full pictures of the wonder and the beauty of the image of God, of just how comprehensive and infinite our God's love is. So the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, I've heard probably a thousand times in my life. My father was a pastor, and every time that he baptized someone, he would use this first from Acts. He would say, what hinders you from being baptized? Nothing. And he would baptize them. So I heard this story a thousand times, but always with a slight southern drawl and like preacher intonation. And so I don't think I ever really heard it, if you know what I mean. That was until I went to a revival, which is, you know, just something I do all the time on the weekend. (laughs) I went to a revival, and I heard a transgender Christian teaching on the Ethiopian eunuch, telling this story. A person named Austin Hartke, who's the author of a book called Transforming. Austin was teaching from this text and telling their own story woven through it. And for the first time, because Austin shared their story, I heard the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Just the same way that the early church, for the first time, I think they heard Isaiah with fresh eyes and open hearts when they met this Ethiopian eunuch who'd been baptized into the family of God. I heard this story because Austin shared theirs, and I heard the heart of God because he shared his story. I heard the story of God. And so what prevents you? nothing. The answer is clear. But even more than that, we need you in your story and all that you are and who God built you to be. We need to hear your story so that we can hear with fresh eyes and open hearts God's story at work in our world, in our generation, in our time, so that we can see with clarity that story arc that is pulling us forward to the time when all people will know what has always been true for all of us and for you, that God's love is for all people, that God's love is for you, that you are accepted and nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving God, thank you for this story. Thank you for those who've had the courage to tell their own. God, thank you for the opportunity and the pull that you've had on my life that has gradually awoken me, opened me, and helps me hear your heart. God, for all of us who have felt separated, excluded, God, felt like we didn't measure up or match up, God, thank you for not leaving us there, but opening the doors so wide, stepping out of the doors to find us where we are, that we might know that nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ. Help us to be people who live that, who share that, and who be that in our world. 
We pray this in your love. Amen.